All right. Well, good morning. You guys have a Bible, take it and open up to 1 Peter chapter 4 with me this morning. If you guys don't have a Bible, there should be one in front of you in the pew. Um, take that and turn that over. 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, page number should be in your bulletin there. Uh, if you guys don't have a Bible in your home, we want you to take that Bible home. That's our gift to you. Um, hopefully you will enjoy it and, and use it. Um, we want you to have a Bible in your home. Um, so as you guys are turning to uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, we'll look at verses 7 through 11 this morning. I'll just share a familiar story with you that I'm sure that you have heard uh, numerous times, but really... Um, puts into perspective in, in a very simple way our text that we're looking at this morning. Um, the story goes like this. A man was walking along a beach upon which thousands of starfish had been washed up. Left on the sand by the receding tide, the starfish were certain to die as the sun dried them out. The man also saw a boy picking up starfish and flinging them back into the sea. And put yourself into the story. Planning to teach the boy a little lesson in common sense... The man walked up to the boy and said, I have been watching what you were doing, son. You have a good heart, and I know you mean well, but do you realize how many beaches there are around here and how many starfish are dying on every beach every day? Surely such an industrious and kind-hearted boy such as, your, as yourself could find something better to do with your time. Do you really think that what you are doing is going to make a difference? The boy looked up at the man, and then he looked down at a starfish by his feet. He picked up the starfish, and as he gently tossed it back into the ocean, he said, it makes a difference to that one. Now, oftentimes we see a need in our lives, in our community, in our church, um, or globally. We watch the news, we, we see what's going on, we see a need, and, and we look at that situation, and we look at the big picture and say, well, I can't fix that situation. Well, you're right, you can't. And oftentimes that's where we get stuck because we think that because I can't change the whole situation, I'm just going to sit back and not do anything, right? And that's what this man was telling this boy. Surely you can find something else better to do with your time because you're really not going to make a difference here. But the reality is, is that he's making a difference to every one of those starfish that he does get back in the water, right? And so when we look at this text this morning and we talk about serving no, we can't change everything. No, we can't serve everybody, but the person that you do serve, the small group that you do serve, makes a difference in their lives, right? So let's pray, and uh, we'll dive into our text this morning. Father God, we love you. God, I just thank you for this time this morning. Uh, Lord, what an honor and privilege it is to open up your word and, and just uh, preach to, to our church. Um, God, I just pray that you would, would use us this morning. God, speak to us uh, through your spirit as it moves in this place. God, draw us to yourself. Open our eyes to the things that are in your word. Um, God, my, my prayer is that you would move us to action. God, that we wouldn't sit back and look at this overwhelming feat and say, I can't change that whole thing. But God, that you would move us to action to make a difference in the life of one. Lord, that's my prayer this morning. God, that you would move us, that you would draw us in, that you would transform us so that we can transform culture. God, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So 1 Peter chapter 4, 7 through 11. Now the end of all things is near, therefore be serious and disciplined for prayer. Above all, maintain an intense love for each other, since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Based on the gift each one has received, use it to serve others as good managers of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks, it should be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, it should be from the strength that God provides so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, I know that we look at this text this morning, you hear that story about the starfish, and you've listened, hopefully, to the things that I've said to this point, and some of you are thinking, Eric's going to make me feel guilty this morning, and I have to serve somewhere in the church, right? Like, some of you are thinking that, because you know, like, you hear, we need people to work in kids' church. We need people to serve in, in, the, in the nursery, right? Like, everybody knows that, right? 
And so you're thinking, okay, here it comes, the guilt trip this morning. My goal and my job this morning is to preach this text. If the Holy Spirit moves you to serve in a specific area of the church, I'm going to celebrate that. But I'm not going to come to you and twist your arm, John, and say, I need you to work in the nursery, okay? <laughs> Although we need you there. <laughs> but, but, but what happens? Think, think about all of, the, all of the years that you've been in church and how many times maybe you yourself or you've seen someone else in the church, they've been guilted into, their arms been twisted to fill a position, right? And they, they just do it. And it's a great thing because we filled that position, right? But the person who's filling that position hates what they're doing and they make it miserable for everybody else that's serving with them, right? And it's just not a good spot to be in. And so as we look at this text, the, the main idea that I want you to see this morning is that transformed people transform culture. Transformed people transform culture. They transform the culture with inside the church and they transform the culture in the community, right? But they themselves, we as individuals, have to be transformed first. And so before we, we move through this text, we need to understand uh, what's going on here, who's writing. Uh, and so we, we know uh, the Apostle Peter is writing here and we know Peter's struggles throughout his life, right? Uh, he denied Christ, um, oftentimes had to stick his foot in his mouth because he would speak before he thought, right? And, and there's, there's times where he really struggled understanding that the gospel was for Gentiles, right? Like he knew that, okay, the, the gospel is, um, salvation is coming to the Jews first. I'm a Jew and that's where I'm at. But, but if you look at, in, in the book of Acts, Peter has these dreams, where God reveals things to him about things that he's doing and, and to get him to understand in this vision that the gospel is not only for Jews but also for Gentiles. And so we find Peter writing here in his first letter to Gentile believers. Gentiles who have come to understand the gospel, who are following Jesus. And here's Peter who struggled with that for so long, who's now writing to them to encourage them because they're going to endure suffering. He's writing from Rome just before he dies to encourage persecuted Gentile believers to endure suffering because Christ himself suffered. And now as they follow him, they too are suffering within the culture. Right, And so when, when we talk about this and, and how this applies to, to our lives and, and to our church and what's going on here, we, we look at the four words that we have that, that's our process. Encounter, connect, serve, and go. Right, you, You've heard those. Hopefully you're, you're getting those into, uh, into your DNA and into your verbiage as you have conversations with people. Encounter, connect, serve, and go. Second Baptist Church is leading people to encounter God through worship to connect with other people in small groups, to serve the church, and to go on mission, right? And so tonight, we're going to have one of our mission teams come back, and they're going to be sharing with us about their trip um, to Haiti. We um, hopefully, in, in this moment now, as we've been singing and praying, and now the preaching of the word, that you're encountering God through this time of worship. Hopefully this morning, you were connecting with other people in your small group right? And so now we're going to talk about serving the church, serving the local church, but also uh, the universal church. So the first thing that I want us to see here this morning in, in talking about transformed people, transforming culture, is that we are called to live like Jesus. Peter says it here in verse 7. He says, now the end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and disciplined for prayer. Above all, maintain an intense love for each other since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. So we read those things. Well, that's what Jesus did, right? Like Jesus was hospitable to people. He loved them above all things. He was serious and disciplined in prayer. And so just as Pastor Mark said last week, that God is the energy that brings about the work in us. Right? So we're talking about serving, like we're not serving in our own strength, right? 
We're not serving people the way that we want to serve. We're serving other people because God has transformed us. And because we're transformed and we're living for another person who is greater than us, a cause that's greater than anything that we could ever be a part of, because we're transformed, now we're living like him through his energy, through the work of the Holy Spirit to bring about what God has for us. And so we see it in verse 7. Peter says to be serious and disciplined. Other translations say to be self-controlled and sober-minded. It literally means the sobriety of the mind. A calm and collective spirit. Somebody who, who understands what's going on around them. Who, who disciplines themselves in prayer and then goes forward thinking clearly to do what God has called them to do. One, one commentary a theologian writer said, said it this way, The Christian who is always on a tear, whose mind is crowded with fears and worries, who is never at rest in his heart, does not do much praying. Because we're always busy, right? Like that's, that's oftentimes what we struggle with. That's what I struggle with uh, individually is, is stopping everything that I'm doing and just to sit and be calm, Right? Because we get so caught up in everything that's going on in our lives, we're always moving at this crazy speed, right? And, and, and we're bouncing all over the place. And so as he says, the Christian who's always on a tear, whose mind is crowded with fears and worries, who is never at rest in his heart, does not do much praying. Because for us to pray, what do we have to do? We have to stop what's going on. We have to, we have to sit in this moment. Right? We, we, have to, we have to go and petition God to, for wisdom, to understand what's going on around us. How, how can I really serve in my church? How can I really serve and transform the culture? What am I supposed to do? And as long as we're going 100 miles an hour in eight different directions, we're not sitting down and focusing in and being disciplined in our prayer. And so the next thing that Peter says, he says, above all, okay, of first importance, above all, everything else, maintain an intense love for each other since love covers a multitude of sins. And he's, he's talking about the love that's produced in us by the Holy Spirit. We're being stretched, okay? It, it's like, like you think about loving people in your life, Right? It's really easy to love people that are nice to you, right? All of us have some family that's really hard to love. Right? Everybody thought of one person, right? Like, you know who that family member is, right? It's really easy to love somebody who loves you, right? Who's nice to you, who does things for you, who serves you. Those are the people that's easy to love, but it's not a stretch for you to love them, Right? But it's a stretch to love the person who just annoys you 24-7. Right? The person who's always asking you to do something. They're always asking something from you. They always want to complain to you. It's a stretch and a strain in your life to love that person, right? But that's the type of love that we're talking about. Because Jesus loved us in that way. He knew that when he came to, to love us in that way, to die on the cross in our place, he knew that people were going to spit in his face and not love him. And yet he stretched and strained to love them in that way. And that's what Peter's talking about. The love that's produced in us by the Holy Spirit. And so apart from us as individuals being transformed, we can't love people that way. We can love for a short time. We can love as long as they're cordial with us. We can love as long as they're participating in the things that we like. But the moment that we have to stretch ourselves and it gets a little bit harder to love them, that's when we start to move away from that person. And we start to gravitate towards people who it's easy to love again. N.T. Wright says it this way, the gift of love 
that we are invited to offer one another minute by minute, day by day, throughout our lives, actually transforms situations. So that the multitude of sins which were there before are taken out of the equation. They're taken out of the equation because that type of love covers that sin. It's not that we're condoning that sin, but we're able to look past it. We're able to forgive those people, even if they've sinned against us, so that we can show them the love of Christ. It's a difficult love. It's something that stretches us out of our comfort zone. Which is why the next verse says, Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Pastor Mark talked about that last week in Philippians 2, to do all things without grumbling and complaining. How many of us complained this morning? Right? Like, like something happened this morning that caused us to complain. Maybe we didn't vocalize it, but we complained, right? I was hoping to get through that light and it turned red. Now I'm complaining about it, right? My, my air conditioner isn't as cold in my car as I wanted it to be. And now I'm complaining about that. My kids didn't get as ready as quickly as they were supposed to. Now I'm complaining about that. They didn't clean up their dishes after they were done. They left all their dirty clothes in the, in the bathroom. Those are all things that happened in my house this morning. It, it happens, right? Things around us happen that lead us to complain. And, and, and we know that and we understand that, but oftentimes what happens is we don't fight against that. Like, that's the thing. When we're transformed people, because God has transformed us in what he's done, and Jesus has rescued us from our sin, now we recognize that tendency in us to complain about things, and now we have to fight against it and not give in to it every moment that we want to complain. And Peter says to be hospitable to one another without complaining. And, and you, you, you put this together with, with the intense love to remain and in, in to continue loving people with an intense love that covers multitude of sin. We see that word hospitable and, and we think to ourselves, well, I invited somebody to my home to eat this week. Or I invited somebody to go out to lunch with us, right? The word hospitable that Peter uses here literally means to be friendly to strangers. People who you don't know. And those are oftentimes not the people who we're being hospitable to, right? Like we're hospitable to each other within the church. We, we connect with other people and inviting people into our homes. But how often do we show that same hospitality to our neighbors who don't know Jesus? Because oftentimes what happens is that neighbor that we're not being hospitable to has those kids that live in the neighborhood that cause us to complain. And we don't want to bring them into our home. And so what we do is we leave them over there and just pray for them. Right? Like we're, we're always praying for them because we want somebody else to come in and share the gospel with them instead of what God is calling us to do and stretching us to love those people and share the gospel with them, to invite them into our homes, to be hospitable to them. And, it, and it's difficult, right? It's difficult because we want to invite people. We want to be hospitable to people who are going to show the same things to us. Because I'm sacrificing my time and my energy and my money to invite this family into my home and I want them to do the same for me, right? That's what we want. But the question that we have to ask is, is that what God wants? Are those the people that God's calling us to be hospitable to? Are those the people in our community that need the gospel? Those are the people that we have to go to. We have to be stretched. So, transform people, transform cultures. And we're called to live like Jesus. And the second thing is that we're tra we are transformed by Jesus and given gifts. So in, the, in, the, in verse 7 through 9, again, understand that Peter is writing to Christians. He's writing to people. He's already assuming. That's why he says to continue in loving people in that intense way. But we know... 
That not everybody that hears this, that sees this, that's sitting here this morning, has that relationship with Jesus. And so the second thing that we see in verse 10 is that we're transformed by Jesus and given these gifts. Based on the gift each one has received, use it to serve others as good managers of the varied grace of God. So we receive gifts when we're transformed by Jesus. If we haven't been transformed, if we haven't trusted Jesus with our eternity, if we're not following him, if we don't have a relationship with him, then we haven't been given these spiritual gifts. And so we we can only serve in certain ways. We can only be hospitable for a certain amount of time. We can only love in a certain way. So what are these gifts? A spiritual gift is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. It's the special spiritual enablements given by God to us graciously. And so if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Romans chapter 12, you you see uh, some some spiritual gifts that are listed. You don't don't have to turn there. I'll just read them for you. Uh, in, In 1 Corinthians 12, verses Um, starting in verse 6 according to the grace given to us we have different gifts if prophecy use it according to the standard of one's faith if service in service if teaching in teaching if exhorting in exhortation giving with generosity leading with diligence showing mercy with cheerfulness and then in Romans chapter 12 Paul again says in verse 6, And there are different activities, but the same God activates each gift in each person. A demonstration of of the Spirit is given to each person to produce what is beneficial. To one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. And so those, those aren't exhaustive list of spiritual gifts but we have to distinguish between a spiritual gift and a skill or a talent that you just naturally have because that skill or talent is developed in your own strength it's not a spiritual gift to play baseball like it's a talent that you have been blessed with in a certain way and you work towards that to get to a certain level but it's not God saved you at 12, and now you automatically can play baseball at a major league level. God hasn't given you that spiritual gift, right? But we have spiritual gifts that God gives us when we trust Jesus, because now the Holy Spirit is is dwelling within us. We're hopefully filled with the Holy Spirit, and now we're exhorting those gifts within the church to serve the church for the glory of God. Paul, or Peter says, based on the gift each one has received. Each one. I, I hear a lot, people who have a relationship with Jesus, they're, they're following Jesus, they just say, well, I just don't have any gifts. Well, that's not true according to that text, Right? But oftentimes we don't know what those gifts are because we haven't walked through that. We haven't studied through that. We haven't prayed through that. We haven't, um, we haven't asked people what they, what they see in us. How, how has God gifted us? What has changed about me since I've come to know the Lord? And Peter says that based on the gift each one has received, use it to serve others as good managers of the varied grace of God. Good managers, other translations say stewards. It, it, it's speaking of this responsibility of the proper use and disposition of something that's been entrusted to one's care. So God has saved us. Now the Holy Spirit is indwelling within us. He's given us these spiritual gifts. And now we have to be good managers and stewards of those gifts to use those in a way that brings glory to God. But how do I know what my gifts are? How do I know? Well, maybe you have a gift and it's not listed in in the scripture. It's not an exhaustive list, right? And, And so, 
Okay, if you, if you don't have the, the gift of, of teaching or of leadership, that's okay. That doesn't mean that you don't have a spiritual gift, okay? Uh, because so, some of us are, are more hospitable than others, right? Like, we, we're hospitable to people, but it, it, some, for some of us, it strains us more than it does for others, Right, and, and and I know for me that that's that's my story. Like I love being around people as long as you're not at my house, <laughs> because listen, listen, and and God brought Anna to me, and it strained me to be more hospitable, because. I, like I can be with with this group of people like I can I can go to to a neutral place and I can have coffee with you and I can do all these things but what happens is when you come to my house I can't accidentally fall asleep because now somebody takes a picture and puts it on Facebook <laughs> Like, these things happen to me, okay? I, I, I led a mission team to Africa one year, and I told them, now I'm going to fall asleep on this plane. We're flying overnight twice in a row. I'm going to fall asleep, okay? Like, it's just going to happen, right? Those of you who went to Haiti with me, it happens pretty quick, right, Ashby? <laughs> Sometimes I don't even know that we took off, and that's okay. But what happens is, is when you get this courage worked up, to take this picture of me and post it on social media. I will return the favor. <laughs> and so I had this sweet lady who did this to me. Our first flight, we get to London, we have Wi-Fi. She posted on Facebook. I just waited, 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 waited. Two weeks after we got back, standing on the platform, sharing our story, boom. There's her picture of her sleeping on the screen she had no idea I had the picture, okay? So, so know that, okay? Be, be careful with that. But, but here's what I'm saying, all right? I love people, and I know that God has called me to be hospitable, to be friendly to strangers. But for some of us, it's more of a strain to, to invite people into our homes, right? Because we have our homes designed the way that we want them. Like that's, the, those are, our things are in a certain place. Our schedule is a certain way because it fits the dynamic of our family. And then you bring another family into that setting and those toys didn't get put up. That thing got broken, right? Like that door got left open, the air conditioner's on. Like all of those things happen, and, and so it, it's, a, it's a strain for me, and, and for some of us, it is a strain, and that's okay. But God has gifted some of us with more hospitality than others. Some of us have, have gifted us as encouragers, right? Like some people just walk up to you, and all they do is say hi, and you're automatically encouraged. Like, I'm not really sure how you do that. I say hi to people, and they walk away mad, but... <laughs> So, so we're all gifted in different ways, but you can't, you can't say, I have a relationship with Jesus, but God hasn't given me any gifts. I'm just, I'm just not good at that. But he has gifted you. And so, so what we have to understand, the third thing that I want you to see is that we use our gifts to serve the church. Peter says in verse 11, if anyone speaks, it should be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, it should be from the strength God provides so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. So it's important. It, it's obviously important for us to share the gospel, right? Like we, those of you that have been involved in the, the Cornerstone Collaborative meetings, and um, we, we presented that um, as just a report last week at, at church, we, we've shared that with you. Well, in the midst of that, we did some updated demographic work, and within our county, within Williamson County, there are 67,000 people, and 37,000 of those people are unchurched. And 14,000 of those unchurched are within five miles of where you're sitting this morning. There are lost people all around us, right? 
And so we know that evangelism is an important thing. We want to share the gospel. We want to see people trust Jesus. We want that, and that's a good thing. And so when, when we see people trusting Jesus, following Jesus, and now they're coming up here and they're being baptized to make that public to the church, we're getting them on the bus, right? They're on the Christian bus, they're within the church, and they're doing great things for the Lord now, right? Here's the problem. When you have a six-year-old who gets saved, you don't want them in the driver's seat of the bus, right? So we have all these people that are getting on the bus, but oftentimes they're sitting in the wrong seat. And so you go back to twisting arms and getting people to get on the bus and sit in a seat, but they're in the wrong seat. They have gifts. We see those gifts being displayed in what they're doing. We've just got to get them in the right spot, right? And so, so you hear us say, we need people to serve in kids' church. We need people to serve in the nursery. We need people to do this. Well, maybe those things that we're saying aren't what you're gifted to do, and you don't feel led to do that. That doesn't mean there's not a place for you to serve. That just means that we haven't vocalized what you're saying is where you're called to serve, and you just need to let us know that. And so if you're questioning this morning, well, what are my gifts? How am I gifted? You can go to our church website and you can fill out the shape test, which has a spiritual gift element within it that will show you based on how you answered scenario questions as to what you're gifted to do. And so we want to get people on the bus, but we also want to get them in the right seat. So we know that we're transformed by Jesus and given these gifts. We know that we use our gifts to serve the church, but why? Why do we serve? Look at the end of verse 11. Peter says, So that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. We don't serve for our accolades. We don't serve so that people will see us doing things. We serve so that God is glorified. It's not our recognition, it's God's glory that we're after, and that's why we serve. That's why we serve the church. So three, three application points to give you this morning, and then, and then we'll close out. The first is that we need to be transformed by the gospel. So again, maybe you're sitting here this morning and you say, okay, that's great. I'm glad that there are people here who have been saved. They have a relationship with Jesus. They have these spiritual gifts and they're serving the church. But I don't even know that I'm a Christian. The first thing to do is for you to be transformed by the gospel, to know and understand that you were created for a purpose. And that purpose is to be in fellowship and relationship with God. But because of sin, you're separated from him. We were all separated from him, and we can't cross that on our own, right? We, we can't do all these good things to cover up our sin. But Jesus came, lived a perfect life, died in your place on the cross, shed your blood to cover that love, to cover the multitude of sin, so that when you trust and believe in him, you are saved. And you can know that for sure, that you're going to have life with Jesus forever. And that life starts right in that moment. It's not something that you, you say, okay, I'm following Jesus, and you have to wait all this time. No, at that moment, the Holy Spirit transforms your life gives you these gifts and now you move into this relationship of discipleship as you grow in Christ and understand what your gifts are and how and where to serve the church. So we have to first be transformed by the gospel. The second is that we need to recognize those gifts that we have been given. Some of us, maybe you've been a Christian for, for a handful of years and you just don't know how you're gifted. You, you don't know what you're doing. You're faithful to being here every week, but you say, okay, I see that need over there, but how can I be involved? What, what do I need to do? Those are questions that we want to help give answers to. We have tons of areas to serve within the church. It's not always just these visible things that are out front. There are other things that, that we need. That, Places to serve that aren't necessarily long-term things, but maybe short-term things where you serve for a couple weeks and, and do this. Or maybe you're just serving for a specific event, and when that event is over, 
you've served and now you're, uh, now you're back to doing what you were doing, looking for the next opportunity to serve. But some of you are called to serve long term as Sunday school small group leaders, right? As a part of the worship team, you are called to serve for a long amount of time and that's a great thing. But not everybody's gifted and called to serve that way. And so as you're praying through, as you're recognizing what your gifts are and looking for places to serve, ask us questions. Find the pastors and, and ask places where you can plug in and serve. So that the third application, so that you can use your gifts to serve the church. We want people to serve. And, and we serve the, the local church here at Second Baptist by, by what happens on Sunday morning, by what happens through the course of the week, what happens on Sunday night, what happens on Wednesday nights, right? But we also serve the global church as we go and um, at the end of each month partner with and serve Redeemer Church, right? We're still serving the church, okay? But we're, we're serving the, the universal, the global church as we go to Haiti and partner with Tapio Baptist and Blanquette Baptist to serve them. So there are plenty of opportunities to serve, and we want you to be plugged in and involved in those things. But again, the most important thing, you can't understand what your gifts are and how to use them to serve the church unless you have been transformed by the gospel first, because transformed people transform culture. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. God, I just thank you for who you are, Lord. I thank you that you transform our lives. God, you transform individuals that there in turn as, as we serve, as we grow in our relationship with you, God, that we transform culture. And so, God, my prayer is this morning that if there are people here who don't have a relationship with you, who need to be transformed as an individual, God, that you would do that this morning. That they would recognize their need for a Savior. That they need to trust and believe in what you have done. God, your love that covered the multitude of sins. God, if there are some of us here who who haven't been serving, God, or, or maybe we're in the wrong seat and we need to serve in a, in a different place. God, I pray that you would, you would move us to action this morning, God, that we would come and that we would pray and, and ask you for wisdom as to where we need to serve. God, we thank you for all that you do and pray all of this in the name of Jesus.